Good morning, Pathway Church. How are you guys doing today? So good to see you. It's good to have Kelly joining me on stage. She just brightens up the stage and makes me look better than I am. So thank you, baby. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, and, uh, you know, fight like a mom coming right up too. That's pretty exciting stuff. It's going to be, that's going to be an awesome, awesome day. So uh, you may have somebody in your world that you want to pick up a ticket for and invite them on out. So I'm anxious to see that. And of course, I'm going to sneak in there. I'm going to sneak in there just in case. We'll let you in. I, I hope so. I got the little key fob to get in the back. If nobody's looking, I'll be hiding up in one of the little air conditioning ducts so I can see what all is going on. It's going to be an awesome time. Hey, listen, before we get into the message, I just want to give a shout out. Um, we probably have a, one of our friends that will be joining us online. His name is Pastor Daro Lotch. He's a part of our work in Cambodia and actually this week is launching their brand new church in the capital city of Phnom Penh. It's called Community Church. Hey, would you guys give Pastor Daro just a really great hand clap and love on him? Really wonderful, wonderful stuff and, and we're so thankful. Um, Tanya and Jim, thank you for allowing us the privilege of praying with you today. We love you guys. I just, one more time, Pathway, would you just put some love on the flans? You guys are amazing. Really amazing. I'm looking forward to jumping into this third week of our message series, Relationship Goals. And, uh, but before we do, uh, let's just go ahead and bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray today that you would just open up our hearts to receive what you have for us uh, regarding relationships and marriage, that you would just help us to connect today, God, with something that you're speaking directly to us. Pray that you bless the service and our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we kick off today, uh, let's just kind of recap what we have talked about um, in our Relationship Goals message series. First, we talked about our goal of being centered on Jesus as one of our relationship goals. Um, goal number two, together on mission. Goal number three, overcoming and victorious, which we'll talk about next week. And then today we're talking about covenant keeping. And um, we're excited to, to talk to you about that today. And one of the things um, that if you're not keeping your covenant, if you're not having a covenant keeping marriage, usually what happens is it ends in divorce. And so we pulled up some divorce statistics to just kind of share with you at the beginning of the service here. And actually this first one, was shocking to me when I read it. I, I couldn't believe the statistic. It says in the United States, there's one divorce approximately every 36 seconds. There's a divorce, which means 2,400 divorces a day, 16,800 divorces a week, and 876,000 divorces in a year. That statistic was, That's I lot. couldn't believe it. That's a I lot. That. You know what? When, as we were putting that together, it reminded me of a Saturday Night Live skit. Actually, that they, there was this uh, reporter on the corner in, uh, in Manhattan, and he said, uh, every eight seconds, a man, a man is mugged every eight seconds in New York. And he said, and we're here with that man right now. <laughs> <laughs> like every couple seconds, he's getting mugged there. But 30, a divorce every 36 seconds in the United States is yeah. pretty staggering. Another statistic, the average length of a first marriage that ends in divorce is eight years. The average age for couples going through divorce is 30 years old. More people are likely to divorce when they have moved in together with their future spouse prior to being married. If your parents are happily married, it means that your risk of divorce decreases by 14%. One in three divorces start off as an online affair, and 14% of adults say that they look through their partner's social media accounts for evidence of infidelity. And the reality is we're in a totally new world. I mean, there are things that your parents did not deal with in marriage that you're dealing with. There are things that your parents didn't deal with in dating that you're dealing with. And now last year, Kelly and I did a, a, a message, uh, we did a series on marriage, but then we shared like top 10 practices that we had to help strengthen our marriage. And one of those had to do with what we just mentioned about social media. And that is this, and we, we encourage all married uh, couples in our church to do the same. And that is to share your passwords with any social media piece that you have, a password to your phone, no secrets. It's just better. It's just better not to have any secrets. You know, the Bible says that men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And I would just say, turn the light on in every part of your life. And as you do that, 
then it means that you share things about yourself that don't reflect well on yourself. I would say create a hospitable environment for your husband, for your wife to share transparently, transparently about the things that they face and the things that they struggle, struggle with. Because when two people are together, man, it really does dispatch the enemy. When, when the enemy carves us off uh, from the safety of our marriage, where we think we're the only one that struggles with that, the only one that thinks that way, then he lies to us. We buy into a lie rather than buying into the victory that Christ has already won for us. Right. And so this series is so important because obviously with those statistics, having a healthy long-term marriage is not usual. It's not normal. And so when we started talking about this, we said, well, what are some of the things that cause marriages to break up, to fall apart? What are some things that you struggle with? Because Everybody struggles with something, and what we struggle with might not be the same as what you struggle with. So we, we started thinking, what, what is it that people struggle with? One of the first things that came to my mind was different upbringings. People that are brought up in a different way, because you're bringing two families together, completely different upbringings, and you're trying to create one unit. And so that was the first yeah. thing that I thought and, of. And you know, even Christ lets us know, the scriptures let us know that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. A believer with an unbeliever is very challenging. But let me tell you the truth about being equally yoked. It's still very challenging. Yeah. It's very difficult because none of us are the same. None of us are the same. I don't understand how Kelly thinks. I, on top of that, I had no sisters. So I learned all kinds of stuff. And now I have daughters and I'm learning things. And it's just, it's just different. And we're really the same in a lot of ways too. We're both pastor's kids. We are. We were brought up a, a very similar. Yeah. But so, at the same time, different, different. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Or in Cambodia, as they would say, same, same, but different. That's right. So um, another thing we thought of was birth order. The way that you were born and your order of siblings has a lot to do with your personality and, and different strengths and weaknesses that you have. For us, we mentioned this last week that we're both first born, which, you know, that's like you have two alphas. You have two people that are used to being in charge and taking care of you know, a younger brother for both of us. It, not that we're trying to dominate, you know, but we're used to taking care of people. And so let me tell you, you put two firstborns together. In fact, let me do, I'm just curious, all over this house, if you're, mar- if you're a firstborn and you're married to a firstborn, would you just raise your hand? It's not a lot, it's not a lot. Because generally we're attracted to, but let me tell you, if you're a firstborn, you're married to a firstborn, you know what Kelly and I are talking about. You feel me? You feel me? Come on. Yeah, I see, I see, I see that, that hand. hand I see that hand, right? I mean, it, it can be, it can be re- really challenging. Yeah, so other struggles uh, that could cause conflicts in marriage, uh, sickness, money, money issues, how you raise your children, parenting, different pa- ideas on parenting can cause a lot of struggles. Your sexual history, uh, communication problem. We've never had that problem. We've never had. We've never had communication problems. Oh, okay, that one. Yeah, no, never. <laughs> never. See. Well, that either, but. <laughs> so, am I all red right now? Okay. I hope all so. Good. That's uh, my favorite part about these messages. <laughs> you didn't do that to me in the first service. I didn't mean to do that. You know, to I wouldn't I come back up here with all. you. Communication uh, baby, problem. Baby, I got you right where I want you right now. <laughs> Let me just, hold on a second. Let me just sip my tea. Mm. Communication problem. So, you know, when, when I say one thing, I know exactly what I'm thinking. It comes out of my mouth and he hears it a completely different way than what I said. Something totally different. That's not at all what I meant, but it's how he interpreted it. So, he man, interpreted, that, that's what you said. <laughs> you're a little feisty during the service. You need to feisty. calm down. Um, Firstborn, I gotta put her in her place there. And then you guys pray for me after Keeping that. score, keeping score on you right now for yeah, sure. I, and then one of the things that uh, we wanted to actually tell a little story about is being married to somebody that's your complete opposite. So being married to an opposite, now we're alike in a lot of ways, sure. but we're also very opposite mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And so uh, it's very interesting. Go, go ahead, go ahead and share to- like um, our 20th anniversary. So is- for instance, on our 20th anniversary, we thought, well, let's take a trip. Let's have fun. Let's go do something awesome. So we decided that we we're going to go to England, which is like, I mean, it was way up on my list. So I was very excited. So we de- decided to go to England. Travis booked the flight and he booked the hotel and he was ready to go. Done. What is there to do after that? 
However, I needed a spreadsheet. So I made a spreadsheet because when you're there, you don't want to miss out on all the awesome, I mean, there's an entire country to get to. So I went and I listed in order like all the things that I wanted to do, the different places you could go, castles. I listed them in one column. I listed how much it cost, what time they were open, what I would need to wear. Do I need tennis shoes or can I wear like cute sandals that day? It's very important to know those things. And I brought my spreadsheet to Travis and I thought, we're going to decide every single day what we're going to do. And I'm going to It was kind of, already like, decided when the spreadsheet got to us. That is not true. I said, honey, what do you, what do you on this list? What is your, like you pick a couple things and I'll pick mine and we'll, D4 we'll make D4 was plan. the only column that wasn't filled out. <laughs> Such no, you are, you're being super go ahead, feisty. Go ahead, go ahead. So I had my plan together and I kept bringing it to him and I thought, why isn't he picking? I've done all the work. Like I've got the homework done. I've, I know what, what, how far it is from our hotel. I literally wrote down everything. Me, I, I went to the Delta app. I booked it and I started walking around the house speaking with a British accent. That's that the preparation. True. That is true. So is that for him? So even up until the flight before, we had not decided what we were doing every day. I was completely stressed out because like we were, we landed and we didn't even know what we were going to do when we landed. He's like, we'll just go rent our car and we'll just drive over to Buckingham Palace. I'm like, well, is it on the spreadsheet? Like, I don't know if that's what we should do today. So even on the flight over, he wouldn't tell me like what he wanted Longest to do Longest flight that is not true either. in the world. That's not true either. <laughs> So we get there, I've got my list, and I kind of chilled out a little bit. I thought, okay, maybe I just need to chill out a little bit. We had a great time. We, we picked did. some things off the list, but the funniest part of the whole trip was that Cambridge was not on my list anywhere. Like, it was just another city. And that was one of the things. He's like, well, let's just go to Cambridge today. And it ended up being my favorite day It was awesome, in punting England. down the river. You know, you got the guy that's pushing down and talking about how the students at Cambridge stole the headmaster's car that he was so proud of and, and uh, uh, hung it from the bridge. That wasn't on this trip. It was, it, was not, it was not on my list, but it was. Hey, remember when we talked about this earlier, you're gonna talk about some of the other good things I did. You totally skipped it in the first service talking about what a good driver I was on the left side of the road. Travis was a great driver on the left side of the road. It was supposed to be <laughs> more spontaneous. Die. We didn't die. You were supposed to just bring that up. You're being all kinds of spontaneous today, so let's move on. <laughs> It was good. So. The plan helped. The plan helped too, because look, I knew. Not only did we know to, that going to the Tower of London there would be lines and how to get to the bridge and all of that stuff, but Kelly knew what line we were supposed to stand in to expedite the trip in the, the path. spreadsheet. To, you know, so it like saved a couple hours of walking around. That's right. I ain't got time for that, but <laughs> it was awesome. It worked out. At the end of the day. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a compliment. It's a compliment. Could you imagine if you married someone that thought exactly like you and did it? That would be the most miserable, boring, no. And you know what? And then you wouldn't get in fights and then you wouldn't get to make up. And then making up is just the best part. That's the best part. So this is an important point. That's the best part. That's the best part, baby. <laughs> this is an important point and it's going to be on the screen. In dating, opposites attract, but in marriages, opposites attack. Yeah, and, and it is so true. You know, you look and you say, oh man, this, this, this person. So, I mean, this person is just so chill and so cool, calm, collected, just so laid back. Right, so that's what you would say in dating. In, in dating. But in marriage, you, you would probably say about the same person, what a lazy bum. I wish you'd get up and mow the lawn and get a job. I don't know. Or, or in, in, in dating, you might say, oh, she's so spontaneous, so spontaneous. But when you're married, you would say, man, she never plans ahead. Or, or, or in dating, you would say, oh, no, I did say, oh, man, she's such a good planner. <laughs> but in marriage, you would say, she's so rigid and doesn't go with the flow. Why does she have to make spreadsheets? I don't know why you read that. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't write that. <laughs> Okay, we're in church. I wrote that. All right. <laughs> you know, in, in dating, you might say, oh, she's thrifty. She's a saver. She saves money. 
You keep changing the, the pronoun. That says he's so thrifty. He's I'm not going to say that I'm going to say he's so cheap. What a tightwad. You, you should buy me that you, jewelry. You changed that. I had already written that, and you changed it when I wasn't looking. Oh, keep going. <laughs> so think about this. In dating, you might say, oh, we're just all we need is love. But in marriage, you say, all we need is counseling. <laughs> you know, or... In dating, you say, we're so in love. And in marriage, you might say, we're so on our way to divorce court. It's just different how you see life when you're dating versus how you see life when you're married. The very thing that attracts you to a person is the very thing that you struggle the most with when you're married. Right. I remember my dad telling me that. I didn't understand it. You will never understand it, even though we just shared this. <laughs> If, if you're not married yet, just pay attention. I'm not telling you not to be attracted to someone that's the opposite. It's kind of like God's design. It's that compliment that actually makes you stronger. I'm just saying be ready for it when it happens. All right. So marriage isn't easy, and it, it's always not been easy. So back in uh, when Jesus was around, listen to this passage for today. A Pharisee asked Jesus about marriage in Matthew 19, verses 3 through 6. Some Pharisees came to him, Jesus, to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So today we're gonna to talk about three approaches to marriage. The first approach is the casual approach. And the casual approach to marriage says, as long as it feels good to me, casual approach. The contractual approach says, as long as you don't default on this marriage, we're all good. We're in a contract. But then the third approach, which is what we want to talk to you about today, is the covenantal approach that says as long as we are both breathing, we're going to make this marriage work. We're not out of it. There's nothing that can happen that as long as we're alive, we're going to keep our covenants to each other. So in this casual approach where we say as long as it feels good to me, here are some of the thoughts that are kind of trickling down through pop culture. And that is that marriage doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's just a piece of paper. Maybe, maybe... I'll give it a try. I'm not giving it a try, but I'm thinking about it. And so you're really grow casual about the seriousness of marriage. And you see this showing up in um, marriage rates. You see this showing up when people are getting married, people cohabiting, living together before marriage. And so our casual nature of marriage bleeds over into the way that we interact and the way that we live together in and sex and all of these things. And so maybe it goes like this. Maybe it's like, hey, um, let's watch a movie um, over at my place tonight. And so your girlfriend or your boyfriend comes over, you watch the movie, fall asleep during the movie. For, for me, for me, a movie with my family is all about me falling asleep. It's the best nap. It's the best nap. And if I can get somebody to rub my hair while that's going on, that's even better. I just... It's awkward when other people are over and you start snoring and that's awkward, but you know, you're dating, you, you fall asleep in the movie and then you stay over until like three and then you slip out and it's like, Ooh, I didn't mean for that to happen, but it's casual. And so, you know what, maybe I should leave a toothbrush there. And then pretty soon you have a drawer in the dresser in case you need to change. And then before you know it, you're sleeping together and then that's progressed to something else and it's all very casual. And then maybe, and you know what, let me say this you know that I'm not stepping up here. We're not stepping up here to condemn anybody. You know that, right? You know that, right? <laughs> the, in fact, if I ever offend you with something that comes from the Bible, don't look at me, look to the Lord, right? But even still, I'm not trying, you know, you can, some people will preach and tell you that you're going to hell and it looks like they're happy about it. But I want to preach and tell you that unless you repent and believe on Jesus, you're going to hell with the attitude that I want you to repent and believe on Jesus, right? This, that's my hope. So in whatever we do today, if there's something where you're going, man, my life isn't lined up here. I'm, listen, I'm not here to condemn you, but I'm here to tell you there's a better way. 
there's a better way. Is that a good word? Is that okay? Would you guys just kind of affirm that so that we just re reinforce the fact that we're going to be people of the word? And so, you know, I guess like, I know you're like, well, but pastor, it's a 21st century and that's a really outdated view, but man, God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's really not subject to our cultural opinions about a thing. And so we're gonna believe him, we're gonna trust him that he has a better plan for us. But a casual approach to marriage will have us playing house and then running to the divorce court. And actually statistics show that living together before marriage actually increases the chance of divorce when you do get married. If you live together before you were married, you're now married, I'm not telling you that you're, that you're sentenced to that. But what I am telling you is that God can take and he can rearrange the things that you have so that you have a covenantal uh, relationship and, and, and marriage. So, so you know, now um, let's, let's say that um, because this casual approach to marriage, it really doesn't work. It doesn't work. You say, well, I want to step up my game. You can step up your game into this next approach to marriage. Which is a contractual approach, which says, we're all good as long as you don't default. We're good. Just behave. Be on your best behavior. Man, that, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Not that we want to break marriages or covenants with one another, but if you're always walking around on eggshells with one another, because now m marriages don't just break up because of infidelity. But marriages are breaking up because, well, I just don't feel satisfied. I don't feel happy anymore. This is not what I had in mind, and it just becomes so disposable. Again, I'm not here to rough anybody up, but that's a rough way to live, that everything's good until we mess up. Right, so a contract is for my benefit. The goal of a contract is to help me focus on rights and responsibilities. And a good contract for me is to increase my rights and limit my responsibilities. Yeah. So let's think practically. Let's say you have rental houses and you rent out houses as a way to earn money and to, you know, to build your personal assets. And so somebody's renting from you. And then the contract says, look, if something breaks, if the air conditioner breaks, I'll fix it as a landlord. But then the contract also says, if you don't pay, you don't stay. Right. So a contract is very like, boom, boom, very rigid, very tight. And it's it's good. Thank God for contracts. We have contracts all over. It kind of lays out the boundaries for what works and what doesn't work. Business needs contracts, but your marriage is more than just a business. If we get to the place where if, I, where if we say, if I'm just not happy, then I'm out. And we live in, you know, it's, it's just a there's a different way for us to do that. And that's the third approach right, to marriage. So the covenantal approach to marriage says, while a contract is based on mutual distrust, a covenant is based on mutual commitment. A contract is based on guarding me against your worst failure, but a covenant is based on providing us the greatest opportunity to succeed. I, I really love that. I really love that. That, let, let me tell you, in any relationship you have, there's going to be a place and a time, many times, where you come up short, you say the wrong things, you do the wrong things. A covenantal approach to marriage says, I want you to do well. Listen, there are times where Kelly lets me down. There are times where I let Kelly down, where, you know, you're short with one another. You say things on the platform while you're preaching together, you're going, oh, I wish I hadn't said that one. Let me <laughs> reel that one back in. But when, when I'm joking, I'm having a blast. We're having, um, every, everything's good. Um, Freddie or Andrick will have a conversation. You guys can counsel us uh, tomorrow or something. Um, but a covenantal approach says, you know, I want the best for you. And there are things that we're both learning and growing in, which is why the apostle Paul gives us 1 Corinthians 13 that love is never puffed up. It's not seeking its own. It doesn't boast. It doesn't envy. Truly, God calls us to a covenant where we actually die to ourselves. And, and so maybe the problem is that we just have a low view of covenant. We don't fully understand what covenant is. A covenantal marriage is not based on uh, mistrust it's, or mutual distrust. It's not temporary. It's not motivated by self-interest. 
Now we get married because maybe we want, we want a companion to live our lives with, but I'm telling you, those things quickly uh, move, move on. And so let, let me just show you how God really takes covenant so very seriously. In the Old Testament, when God strikes a covenant, blood is shed. A bull, a lamb is slain. And then in the new covenant, Jesus has given us, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And every time the, these covenants happen, there is a dying, there, there is a death. And let me tell you, it's the same thing in marriage. Because when, when we're married, the two become one. We die, I die to Travis. Kelly dies to Kelly. This is what's supposed to happen. And the two become, the two become one. Now in math, one person plus one person equals two people. But in covenant marriage, one man plus one woman equals one flesh. There's a dying and a death to self. Yeah, so we actually, we're reading through this, I thought of our own vows and our vows are really- and How important they, they are. They were so important right. um, that we wanted to write them ourselves for our wedding day. And so we thought, oh, what a beautiful thing. Let's write our own vows. You know, we'll say what's on our heart to each other. So we wrote our own vows. And then we decided to take it to the next level and we said, why don't we memorize our vows? Wouldn't that be awesome? Like mistake. not having to repeat each, you know, the vows from somebody else. That was like the worst mistake ever for a bride on her wedding day to be trying to remember her vows the entire time before the wedding. You could, there's pictures of me just staring down. Like I wasn't afraid about getting married. I didn't, wasn't afraid about the flowers or tripping. I was afraid I was gonna forget my lines because we'd memorize a whole page of vows which happened. So we get up there and I'm like repeating my vows. I've got to memorize. I'm like, if I can just get past this part. So I get to the part, I get to one of the parts and I, the line just slipped my head and I paused for a minute. Long. But dramatic. everybody in the audience thought Pause. that I was crying. So they're like, oh, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm just trying to remember that. I think I skipped the line and just like went on to the next. And, and nobody knew. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. They thought I was crying. But for us, that vow was important. It, you know, to invest ourselves in that vow. I mean, it's a little thing. The Lord understood what we were thinking and we were able to give our vows, but it was important to us because the marriage covenant is important to God. And, and so we had um, vested ourselves. And the reality is that marriage does matter. The marriage covenant is important to God. It should be important to us. So marriage does matter. It's not just like an outdated institution. Marriage is the very first institution ordained by God very first, before the church and before government. We have a lot of government stuff going on right now. People running for office. I would not dismiss that. I don't diminish that. Uh, politicians are saying all kinds of things about one another. I, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing that. That's a holy institution ordained by God. I, I never wanna dismiss that or dismiss our leaders wherever they uh, are serving. I also never wanna diminish the church. You know, the church is a holy institution ordained by God, but so is family. And so the marriage, the very first institution ordained by God is serious and it's important to God. So marriage matters and, 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 and sex matters. And, and let me just say this, I don't care if people think I'm old fashioned or whatever, and it, it, it's possible, it's possible to do this, but you should wait until marriage before you have sex. Come on, man, somebody just needs to honor the Lord, just bless him. That's a statement we're making. It should wait until marriage. And you know, if you've already done that, if you're young and you're dating and, and you've already crossed that bridge, listen, I don't want you to heap condemnation on yourself, but from this moment, you can say, God, I'm taking this serious. Or I didn't know that, I didn't know that. I thought that was just something people said. No, this is what the Bible says. It's one of the 10 commandments in this Old Testament mosaic covenant between God and man. And so from this point on, we can walk this forward. Marriage is a holy covenant. Hebrews 13, four says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed be kept pure, even before marriage. Right, and some of you might say, well, you don't understand. My marriage is bad. I, I'm in a bad marriage. You guys have a perfect marriage. You, everything looks great. It's all good. Well, that's not true because we decide how our marriage is gonna be. When we're not feeling it, we make a choice for each other. And so, you know, you might say something like, well, I don't feel like being nice today, or I don't feel like forgiving them today. I don't feel like working on things today. That's 
Those are choices that you're making. And there aren't many other areas that you can make choices like that. I mean, what if you said, well, I don't feel like feeding my kids today. They're going to starve. I don't feel like paying my taxes today. Well, you're going to go to jail. To jail. Yeah, so for sure. you, you need, you, you make choices about things, but this is something that we've decided there's no choice this is it. We're in the covenant. We're in our commitment together. And so, you know, you fought, you have these emo romantic notions towards people, but you don't fall in love. You choose to love someone. It's a choice. If you fell in love, you could get out of that ditch. But when we choose to love one another, it's for life. It's for life. I think it's not only that we choose to love one another. We don't just choose to have these relationship goals types of pictures. Remember last week, the wool socks in front of the fire and the hot chocolate, this romantic kind of scene, or, or we had the picture of, of the, the, the couple in the kitchen and it was so sweet and everything. But we choose, we choose to be centered on Jesus, number one. We choose to be together on mission. We choose to be covenant keeping. And then next week we're gonna choose to, become, to be overcoming and victorious. It doesn't just happen. It's not something that just falls into our lap, but it's something that has to be obtained and possessed. We have to fight for it. We have to, we have to look, Kelly and I don't do everything perfect. There are some things that we do good because we've chosen. We've chosen to date one another every Friday. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice to pursue that. And I would just challenge you to choose that covenantal approach with Christ and that covenantal approach in our marriage. And I think we may have, and, and you know, if you would just go ahead and stand with me, let's just try and. We look at our marriage in a contractual way because we might look at our our covenant with Christ in a contractual way, where we see how unfaithful we are to God and you know, we're just falling in and out of favor with God all the time. But I want you to understand that we are in a covenant relationship with Jesus. And in this covenant relationship with Jesus, he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Just stop and think about this just for a second. Jesus is trapped in the worst marriage the Bible says he's the groom and the church is the bride. He's always faithful. How long has it been since you failed God? Was it this morning? Was it this morning? Somebody cut me off this morning. Somebody cut me off. I was good. I was behaved. But you know, I can think of things that were just out of my control. My, before my mind had a chance to engage, my mouth went into action. My behavior went into action. How many times have we let God down? I'm not saying that you're, you can do whatever you want and be in relationship with the Lord, but I'm just telling you that Jesus is a lot more faithful to us than we're faithful to him. And so we bring that over into our relationship with one another. Here's what I would say, occupy the position of Christ in your marriage, that you say, I am committed to you. I want the best for you, I want the best for us. And man, it's crazy what we do. We have the tendency to interpret like for our spouse, when they do something wrong, we, inter we judge them based on their actions. But when we do something wrong, we judge ourselves based on our intentions. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to cut you off. That guy cut me off. I was on the phone with Kelly. I said, man, that joker just about ran me off the road. Probably just didn't see me. I was just probably in the blind spot, you know? Actually, I saw a bunch of clothes hanging up in the back of their window. They had a Delaware license plate. They're probably on their way home from vacation. I ain't tired. That's what I do. When something goes wrong with me, I can rationalize it away. Maybe it's time for us to bring a covenantal approach into our marriage that says, I believe the best about you and for us. And I know that God can translate that right down into our relationships right now today. And, but I, I would say here, I would say that in our relationship with one another, we can't go wrong by getting our relationship right with the Lord. And this is what we said on day one. We said, if you're looking for your spouse, before you get your two, get your one. Jesus is your one, first priority. 
If you want to keep a covenant with your spouse, then get a good covenant with Jesus. Because how can you be forgiven of so much and then turn around and not forgive when you've been done wrong by your spouse? You know, the next time that you get down on your spouse for something they did, something they said, how about we stop and think about what God has forgiven us for? Maybe be a little more long suffering, a little more patient, a little more kind. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. How many times has the Lord spoken gently to us when we failed him? How many of you are saying, Pastor, I'm just believing that God will do a good work in me even before he does a good work in my marriage, that God will do a good work in me even before he does a good work in my dating relationships that might turn into a marriage. How many of you say, Pastor, I want my covenant to be right with the Lord. If that's you, just slip up your hand right now. I want it to be right with the Lord. But you're saying, I'm believing that 2020 is gonna be the best year of marriage that I've had. And there are some things that surely there are to overcome, but I'm believing that God is gonna perform good works in our life. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand right now? It's good things. Here, let me ask something for our unmarried folks today. You say, Pastor, I want to be dialed in with Jesus in my covenant so that I'm prepared for the covenant with my future spouse. If that's you, you're saying that's the person I wanna be. I don't wanna be completed by any other person, but by Jesus. I, want, I don't wanna be a half person getting together with another half person, but I wanna be made whole in Jesus and bring something to a potential marriage. If that's you, just slip up your hand right now. And that's awesome. What a declaration to the Lord right now. Would you just reach over and take the hand of your spouse right now? In fact, do this. Just take both hands uh, of your spouse. I mean, just, just reach over and, and just join with one another into agreement. You know, you're having to actually look at one another and we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. We're gonna speak a blessing over one another right now. And baby, if you just bless the people and then, and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna pray. We're gonna ask, how many of you believe God can do something powerful in this moment, in this spiritual moment? Amen. Father, I thank you so much for marriages. God, I thank you for each couple, each family that's represented here. And I pray that you would do a work like only you can do. Lord, there's been words spoken today. Some of us have grabbed onto certain things. Some of us have grabbed onto other things, but God, I pray the work that you're doing in each couple that you would just bring it to completion today. Restore marriages and bring families back together, Lord. We thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Lord, we rebuke the devourer in these relationships, these marriage relationships. Father, the locust and the canker worm that would seek to tear down and destroy. And Father, not only in marriages, but Father, where the enemy would come to destroy and to take away even before a relationship starts by chewing away and causing loss in a person's life that would cause self-esteem issues and would, would call, cause feelings of failure and condemnation. Father, we just speak life over every single person in this house. Father, we are victorious in you. We are not victims. There may have been things in our past that have happened, things that are even defining us today. But Father, we are not defined by our circumstances. We are defined by our Christ. We thank you for that right now. Father, we pray that you bring healing and life and strength today. We speak over these marriages, that statistics about divorce and brokenness would not be applied to this house. Father, we pray that healing would reign in this house. And Father, where there's brokenness, Father, I pray that you'd speak life and wholeness and recovery and strength, and that we would know that we're loved by you. Father, we thank you for your word of grace and your word of peace that comes from, uh, from your scriptures. And Father, we pray that you, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is leading leading us through all of this journey, Father, where we're made strong in you. And Lord, we love you for that. We love you for the work that you've done in this house. We love you that your word doesn't return void. Father, we love you that your word says that we're made overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So Lord, thank you for using our victories. And Lord, we thank you for using our failures as we speak them out to encourage one another that there is life in you. And we love you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, Pathway, let's give the Lord a great big hand. Let's bless him today.